When I joined Motor Age over a decade ago, I was fortunate enough to be able to travel the country and meet technicians from across our nation. And one of the questions that I loved to ask was, are you currently using a scope to help speed up your diagnostic process? And back then the resounding answer was no. Today, more and more technicians have embraced this relatively simple tool and have discovered the real power it can bring to their troubleshooting, not just in electrical systems, but nearly every system on the car. And I'm not here to talk to those techs today, but rather I want to address those of you who have not yet joined the ranks of the Scope Faithful, for whatever reason that might be. I want to show you just a few of the ways that the Scope can be used to improve your diagnostic process and efficiency in the hopes that you'll try this powerful diagnostic tool for yourself. Let's get started. The scope just by itself can be used to perform any task that you would normally use your digital voltmeter for. But the real power of the scope is its ability to measure voltage and voltage change over time and display that information on a screen where the information is easy to see, something your digital voltmeter can't do. Now keep in mind that both are digital measuring tools which means that they don't display the voltage or input in real time. They sample it and then they plot that sample or average that sample to give you the display that you actually see on the screen. But the most powerful difference between the two is that the scope can sample way faster. Glitches and dropouts in critical control module inputs that you would never catch using your voltmeter, even a graphing multimeter, you can find with a scope. Verifying the integrity of module inputs like crank and camshaft position sensors, MAF sensors, nearly any electrical input you can think of can be done with a scope. Checking a vehicle's ignition timing, important on today's vehicles that are no longer equipped with timing marks, can be done with a scope. Troubleshooting misfires by interpreting the ignition waveform can be done with a scope. Inspecting the operation of the fuel injectors both electrically and mechanically, can be done with a scope. You can even perform a compression test of sorts with just a basic scope. But the real power is unlocked when you invest in certain accessories. These accessories can take whatever it is they're measuring, current, pressure, vacuum, vibration, even noise, and convert that into a voltage output that the scope can understand and display. A common accessory included with scopes is the high amp current clamp. Now this tool is used to measure current at levels like those you would see when the starter motor is cranking over the engine. You know, the conventional starter draw test. Only when you look at the pattern on the scope, there's so much more information to see. First, let me explain a few terms you should be familiar with. Scopes can offer the user a single channel, two channels, four channels, even eight channel scopes are available. Think of a channel as an independent scope all by itself. So that means that a multi-channel scope is like having several scopes all displaying their information on the same screen. And that comes real handy for a variety of testing. For example, like when you're checking the sync between a cam and crankshaft position sensor, or if you want to perform an if-then test, looking at a module input and then waiting to see if the expected output happens. The scope screen itself is divided into sections, usually eight or 10, both vertically and horizontally, kind of like the graph paper you use in seventh grade math class. The bottom or horizontal line is the x-axis of the graph and is divided into units of time, also referred to as divisions. The time settings can be adjusted by the user and range from nanoseconds to minutes per division and anything in between. The vertical line is the y-axis and is also divided into sections, but this one is divided into units of voltage and they can range from 10 millivolts per division to 20 volts per division. Just like the time divisions, voltage divisions can also be set by the user. Generally, most of the tests you'll perform will be based on the 2020 rule. What this means is that you'll adjust the time divisions to 20 milliseconds per division and choose a voltage adjustment that will allow you to have a sweep or full screen range 
of 20 volts. Why? Well, the vehicle electrical systems are 12 volt, aren't they? So a 20 volt range will just about cover everything you connect to with few exceptions. And as far as the time divisions, well, 20 milliseconds per division on an average scope screen having 10 divisions is a total sweep of 200 milliseconds. And that's just about the amount of time it takes for an engine to complete two full revolutions at idle. Now the process of getting an image on the screen is called getting a capture. And the resulting pattern is often referred to as a waveform. And once I have the waveform on the screen, I can fine tune the image by adjusting the time and or the voltage settings until I get just what I want to see on the screen. Now let's get back to the use of the high amp clamp to perform a starter current draw test. We'll first connect the high amp clamp to a channel on the scope. Then we'll place the amp clamp around either of the battery cables, positive or negative, whichever is the easiest to access. But we have to be sure that we get all the positive or all the negative cables if there are more than one attached to the battery post. Now here's where a little thinking on the user's part comes into play. We started our scope settings based on the 2020 rule, but remember, the time divisions were based on an engine that was running at idle speed, roughly 750 RPM. If I'm going to do a starter cranking test, then I'm not going to be spinning the engine over at anywhere near that speed. So we need to make a small adjustment to accommodate for that. So let's bump the time setting to 500 milliseconds, or a half second per division. I also have to remember that the high current clamp is measuring current but then converting it into a voltage output for the scope's benefit. Luckily, most modern scopes will automatically adjust the vertical scale to amps, so you don't have to do the math. You just have to telescope what kind of accessory you've connected to it. Now, if your scope didn't come with this feature, that's okay. Your current clamp did come with some type of conversion factor that will equate millivolts to amperage. Then you just have to take the millivolt reading your scope is displaying and do the math yourself. Once my initial settings are made, I still need to do one more thing. I need to tell the scope when to start displaying the data. This is called triggering, and you can learn more about triggers and how they're used in our video Motor H How To number eight, using trigger settings on your scope. You'll find the link to that video and a few others that I'll be mentioning later today in the video's description. You'll also see little informational cards, like that one, that will allow you to access the link directly. Now, all that's left is to disable the fuel system, so the engine won't start when we crank it over. Now, that peak in the current level, you might think, is the same as starter current draw. Notice that it's really high, but you have to remember that a scope samples so fast hundreds of thousands of samples a second, even millions of samples a second. So what we've captured is a microsecond amount of time where we've seen just how much current it really takes to overcome the inertia of the starter and the engine. This is typically referred to as inrush current. And that's not all you can see if you know where to look. See the small increase in current flow here? That's when the ignition key was turned to on. And a little later on, as the driver moves the key to the start position, you'll see an increase in that current level to about 25 amps. This is the time that the starter solenoid was energized and the contacts closed. Shortly after the peak in current, the pattern seems to settle down into an almost rhythmic pattern that kind of looks like the teeth on a saw. These are a result of the pistons moving up and down in their cylinders. And if the cylinder is weak, we'll notice that the amount of current it takes to get it to run through its 720 degree cycle is not as much as the others. And we'll see that in this display. In fact, this test is often referred to as a relative compression test. And it's a good, quick, easy way to see if there's a cylinder that's not contributing its fair share without taking anything apart. Unfortunately, this test doesn't tell us what the cause of the low compression is. Is it a problem in the valve train or a problem in the bottom end, the piston or piston rings? But with a little help from an accessory called a pressure sensor or a pressure transducer, 
Our scope can tell us that too. Pressure sensors and transducers are two accessories that can really open up the diagnostic possibilities of your scope. But they are two different things. The pressure sensor reacts to changes in pressure while the transducer can actually measure pressure. Now think about it for a minute. If the pistons are moving up and down in their cylinders, what do you expect to happen to the pressure in the bottom end in the crankcase? It's going to change, right? So if I attach a pressure sensor or transducer to the oil dipstick tube, I should see pulses something like this. If I do and the pattern is stable, then I know the loss of compression has to be a result of something in the top end. But if I see a misshapen peak or one missing, well then I can suspect that the problem is in the bottom end. And if I really want to nail it down, I'll add one more channel and attach it to an ignition coil, any coil, so I can identify the cylinder by the firing order. And we call this little trick adding a reference. Some examples of additional uses of these accessories include performing a non-intrusive injector pressure drop test to identify a sticking or open injector, or measuring intake vacuum and monitoring the changes that occur as the valves open and close, which just happens to be one way to further isolate the cause of low compression coming from a fault in the top end. And the pressure transducer mated to a scope has also opened the door to what is arguably one of the most effective and useful diagnostic tests to date, the in-cylinder pressure test. By monitoring the change in pressure in the cylinder as it goes through its full 720 degree cycle, we can identify issues in ignition timing, cam timing, variable valve timing and actuation, even cam crank synchronization and more. And it's more than I could possibly cover in today's episode. So if you want to know more about in-cylinder pressure testing, check out the trainer number 31. The link is in the information card and in the video description. And before we call it a day, I must share one last accessory, the low amp clamp. The low amp clamp can be used to test the health and operation of electric motors, like fuel pumps or door window motors. It can be used to monitor current and ignition coils, fuel injectors, and any other electrical component, especially those that use a coil of wire to operate. And when you're testing fuel injectors or ignition coil primaries, these devices typically use a shared power feed, which means you can check all of them at once. And it's a great way to identify one that has a shorted or open coil. It's also a great way to monitor current loss when you're trying to chase down an intermittent parasitic battery drain. Well, we've covered quite a bit, but we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of all the things that a diagnostic storage oscilloscope or scope with mated accessories can do for you in your diagnostic process. If you take the time to learn how to operate the scope and interpret the results, you'll become a lot more efficient and spend a lot less time in your troubleshooting. And spending less time on your troubleshooting means you can make more money. And that's a good thing, right? Thanks for watching.